Welcome to the New Church Podcast. For 2,000 years, the church has been characterized by a lot of different things. Some good and some not so good. Self-discipline, compassion, mercy, and charity? See, these are extensions of the heart and the teaching of Jesus. When the church is at its best, it's got a desire to grow into the people that God has called us to be, to carry the gospel, to remain faithful, to worship God, and to love people. And over the years, the church has been ravaged by persecution and tested by every kind of trial and temptation imaginable. And yet, generation after generation, the church has prevailed. Jesus said he would establish his church, and the gates of hell would not be able to stand against it. The church has been trusted with a mission. God has called us to do the only thing worth doing in this life. He's called us to be the light of the world. He's called us to embody love and to be the agent of hope wherever we go. The faithful have always known that life is better when we join together, when we gather in faith around the promises of Jesus, when we stand united against the common enemy of everything that is good. But we shouldn't pretend like that's always gone well, or that it's always been easy, because there have been times when the church has joined the enemy, when it's promoted hate instead of love, bondage instead of freedom, and darkness instead of light. There have been too many times when the church has failed in that mission that was trusted to us. But hope was never lost. The light was never completely extinguished. There have been times that have tested who we are, but they've never changed who we are. God has always been faithful to call his people back to him. His kindness leads us to repentance. And repentance, it means that we turn away from sin. We turn back to Jesus. But you know what's tearing up our church right now is a unique and rather clever attack of our ancient enemy. There is a great evil that's threatening us, but it's not with war or violence or anything obvious. It's still every bit as deadly, though. Because we're divided, we're isolated. We're driven more by sadness and fear and anger than we are by faith. This current challenge, it attacks the very nature of of who we are. Because of this COVID-19 thing, both the virus and the response to it, we're losing the vulnerable. We're unable to physically be with some of the people we love. We're unable to gather in person around the Word of God and around the promises of Jesus. We're as terrified at the thought of losing our sources of income as we are at losing the people we love. We're angry that government bureaucrats with suspicious motives are overreaching the authority that we gave them. And they're treating us like children. We're angry that so many people aren't taking this viral threat serious enough, and they're putting other people at risk. 
It breaks our heart when we hear about someone who has been robbed of their life and their future. Where's the church supposed to be in all this? Is it okay to be sad? Is it okay to be afraid or angry? Because we're emotional people. That's the way God made us. It's okay to feel our emotions, but it's not okay to let those emotions drive us to sin. It's not okay to abandon our calling and our faith. It's not okay to stop being the church, to forget who we are, to stop loving people. It's not okay to lose ourselves in all this craziness and stop pointing to the life and the hope that we have in Jesus. We're being tested. For the sake of the church, which is the hope of the world, we need to pass this test. Now, it's understandable to be sad. Because every one of those statistics that we hear on the news, every one of those numbers... They're all a person that someone loved. It's someone's grandma or grandpa or teacher or friend or someone's mom or dad. Death is our enemy. It's not our friend. We mourn the loss of the people we love. But we don't grieve like those who don't have any hope. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he was explaining the very sad things that were about to happen to him and to all of them. And he said, I've told you these things so that in me you can have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Because God cares for you, you can cast your cares on him. See, this is part of that light that the church brings into the world. Sadness may test who we are, but it must not change who we are. And it's also understandable to be afraid. We are bombarded with the message that we should be afraid the media, in their desperate pursuit of selling soap. They've learned that nothing sells as well as fear. We will glue our faces to the screen of the television if they can convince us that we're in danger. They infect our conversations and our dreams, and they poison every waking moment with scary news of coronavirus outbreaks and death and destruction and the dangers of shopping and breathing and whatever else. And they do this, they do it because they want to manipulate us. They want to control us. And we let them. We actually pay them money to do it. We fork out their subscription fees and we buy into their hysteria just like they want us to. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There really are terrifying things in this world. But we don't have to be afraid like people who don't have faith. We're supposed to be courageous because we believe that the God who's in control of everything, even the terrifying things... We believe that he loves us, that he's for us. He wants us to be brave in the face of all this darkness and evil. In Isaiah 41.10, it says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
See, fear may test who we are, but it must not change who we are. And it's certainly understandable to be angry. I'm probably a little more in touch with my inner rage monster than like with my internal scaredy cat or or uh, my internal emo boy. I'm more tempted to let my anger boil up over all the stuff that's going on. The way some of, so many of our hopes and dreams have been put on hold or shut down and destroyed completely by some politician's attempt to look like they're doing the right thing. Man, every little coffee shop or restaurant or business that got shut down by this thing, that was someone's dream. And more than that, it was someone's livelihood. It's the way they made a living. It was their life. You know, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 24 that it's wrong to take a person's tools or their business because that's the way the person makes a living. It is the darkest kind of sin to take away a person's ability to provide for their family. And then you add to that all this mask shaming and morality bullying from people who, with all the good intentions in the world, would condemn anyone who chooses freedom over safety or survival over compliance. And then there's all that unhelpful, sarcastic preaching of the skeptics, the people who think this is all just a bunch of hype. And man, when they do that, they dismiss the sacrifices that people are making when they just call it herd mentality and cowardice. That's demoralizing. And you know what? All too often, the split between those two camps, it's along those same familiar party lines of left and right that we've all come to expect in every single thing. All of this is infuriating. I have to work pretty hard at not letting my anger take me to unfaithful and unhealthy places. I have to remember what it says in Ephesians 4.26. It says, be angry, but do not sin. Which is kind of like saying, be hot, but do not sweat. Because in James 1.20, one of my favorite Bible verses, by the way, I should have it tattooed on my face in reverse, so I have to read it every time I look in the mirror. Because James says the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, I'm pretty fond of the myth of righteous anger, but giving in to what makes me mad almost always leads to sin. Anger may test who we are, but it must not change who we are. The, burden, the burning question that faces the church today, though, it's not whether we're going to get through this or not. Because of course we will. The real question is who are we going to be when this is all over? Will we be people who have been patient, brave, and determined to persevere in our faith like the church that came before us? You know, COVID-19... It's literally a cold. It's a really bad, deadly cold. Are we going to let a cold prove that we're not who we thought we were? Are we going to let a cold rob us of joy and hope? Are we going to let it succeed in driving us to selfishly give in to our sadness and fear and anger? Are we going to fight with our neighbors and give in to pettiness rather than love? Are we going to be defined as the church 
by what we're against, or by what we're for. Who are we going to be when this is all over? Are we going to be a pawn of our enemy? Or are we going to be the church, the people of God in Christ? Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, Jesus says the church is going to prevail. So I have never doubted that it will. You can't break something that Jesus has blessed. A church that's built on the sure foundation of Christ the solid rock, it's going to stand as long as we know that we are the people of God who are in Christ, the redeemed of the Lord, people who are given the authority and the commission to love the world in His name, the name of Christ, as long as we know that before anything else, we're Christians, then we won't fail this test that's in front of us. And thanks be to God, many of you are doing just that. I am so thankful for all my fellow brothers and sisters who pray for an end to this outbreak and an end to these draconian measures to control it. The church is a people of prayer. I'm thankful to all of you who have been faithful in gathering around God's Word online, like singing in your living rooms, staying connected to your church, checking in on each other during the week, continuing to support your ministry in every way possible, including faithful giving, participation in Zoom Bible studies, discipleship groups, leadership groups, recording all those little pieces for our worship services. The church is a people of faithful worship. I'm thankful to all of you who have cheerfully gone along with those stay-at-home orders, even though it might have been difficult and costly to you. The church submits to the authorities that have been placed over them by God. I'm thankful for all those times that you wanted to rant and blow off steam on social media. But then you remember that you're supposed to be people of peace and bring the hope of Christ into the world, not to be used as a pawn to stir up more sadness and more fear and more anger. The church is to be known by our love for one another. And I'm even thankful for those who prayerfully and carefully say the things that need to be said while remaining kind and gracious. In other words, being angry and not sinning. Because the church speaks the truth in love no matter what the cost. I'm thankful for the members of the church who continue to be the light of the world that we're called to be. Every minute of your faithful service to the Lord as his people on earth brings a little more hope to the world around us, brings us a little closer to better times. I'm thankful for everything the members of the church are doing to help and protect the vulnerable to bring comfort to people who have lost loved ones. For all those times that you've stepped up and offered hope in the face of despair. For continuing to point to Jesus no matter what is going on. With God's help, we are going to be able to face this strange enemy. Both the COVID disease and the cure. I want to assure you of this. If we love each other, if we're resolute in our faith, then we will pass this test. The early church and the saints of old 
they were faithful through a lot of different dark times, just like these. And they carried the light of the gospel, keeping it safe, and then they trusted it to us. We have to carry this same light through our present time and then hand it safely to the future. The Queen of England, she made a speech about this COVID crisis the other day. And in her speech, she said, On the day you embrace your mother again, your father, your sister or brother, your friend or your co-worker, you will have endured a great challenge, proving yourself patient and resolute in your sacrifice for your fellow man. She was trying to encourage her fellow Brits to stay the course and to make sacrifices for their neighbors, which is always a good and noble goal for people to do. But this is what you know that people outside the church don't know. You know that although we're always going to have more to endure, although a life of sacrifice is always called for, better days are always ahead. No matter what happens to us, we will be with our friends again. We will be with our family again. We will all meet again. If not in this life, then in the life to come. And on that day, we won't only have proven ourselves to be as faithful as the church that came before us, but our perseverance will make sure that those who come after us, our children and their children, that they'll also know the love and the grace of God. Because they're going to need us to faithfully pass these treasures to them so that they're going to be able to endure the challenges of their own time. When our part of this race is run, we will have held on to our strong identity in Christ. We will have turned to Jesus when everything seems so fragile. And trusting in Him... Trusting in him, we will have passed the ultimate test. Until then, we have to continue to be the church in our time. We have to move forward with a renewed commitment to hold the light of Christ higher than our sadness or our fear or our anger. We need to hold up the faith that he's given us so the world can have a little more light and a lot more hope. I used to lay awake in bed at night arguing with friends in my head. Like I would have conversations with them at school or after school about Jesus. And then I would lay there in my bed trying to fix all those conversations, everything that went wrong the first time. I just wanted them to see Jesus the way I saw him. I wanted them to know that God loved them, that he was real, that it was all true, that Jesus had given his life and rose from the dead so that they could have hope, that death wasn't the end, that this isn't all there is. But see, people are never argued into faith. That's just not how it works. People aren't really argued into anything. You can't change anyone's mind by fighting against them. If you do that, they just dig in deeper. But you can change someone's heart by loving them. You can stand beside someone and walk with them until you become friends. And then they might be interested in what you've got to say and where you want to take them. You know, 
These days, the church is more known for what we're against than the things we're for. I'm hoping that we can change that. God is for you, and he wants you to be for other people. That's not going to be easy, because everyone's all dug in. That's why the way we have to worship God is to love people. If we're going to be the church, the people of God in Christ, that carry the light of the gospel, if we're going to be the hope for the world, if we're going to pass this treasure on to the next generation, if we're going to pass the test, then this is who we have to be, and this is what we need to do. I'll close with these words from Hebrews chapter 12. Paul is also talking about the church and difficult trials they were facing. Instead of passing a test, he says it's more like running a race. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, this would be the saints of old, the church that handed faith to us, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given up your lives in your struggle against sin. And then in verse 14, it says this, Work at living in peace with everyone, and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other, so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. For 2,000 years, the church has been characterized by a lot of different things, some good and some not so good. We're being tested. And it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel afraid. It's even okay to feel angry. But it is not okay to give in to those emotions, to abandon our calling, and to abandon our faith. It's not okay to stop being the church, to forget who we are, and stop loving each other. For the sake of the church, which is the hope of the world, we have to pass this test. And I have every reason to believe that with the help of God, we will. Amen. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurchtx.com slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.